What's up you guys and welcome back to my channel. So today I am covering a solved no body case and these cases always blow my mind but this one in particular had me absolutely floored. We love covering solved cases on this channel for many different reasons, mainly because there's always some closure and you kind of get to see the process from start to finish, how the case was solved, the things that went wrong, the way those things were corrected. You get to kind of see someone's behavior and then match it up to their possible guilt later. And it answers a whole bunch of questions. With the solved no body, there's still not full closure. This person has still not been found despite knowing that someone is responsible for their murder. And this case as well has a few components to it that I have never really touched on on my channel um, that I really hope starts a conversation down in the comment section below. Um, I feel like a lot of people will have very, very strong opinions on this and I'm interested to see what you guys have to say. And this case is also a perfect case to talk about after last week's video on Lee Cutler, where there was kind of a question on whether he ran away willingly or if it was suicide or if something was wrong. Probably stress on this channel once if not more in every single video that it is so dangerous to shut down ideas or possible theories based on small bits of possible evidence. Unfortunately, when it comes to people willingly running away, as soon as that thought gets into someone's mind, all other theories for some reason are shut down, the investigations stop, and I feel like that's so dangerous and I understand why this happens. I understand why authorities kind of, you know, let the case just settle on its own. But this right here is the epitome of why that is so incredibly dangerous to do. And I feel like after seeing some comments that I did last week about Lee Cutler, about, uh, you know, the fact that if it's obvious someone ran away, that everyone just needs to back off, this right here will show you why you should never do that. And that is exactly why I picked this case today. So let's go ahead and just jump right on into it. So today we're talking about the disappearance and murder of Julie Ann Gonzalez. Now, Julie was 21 years old when she went missing from Austin, Texas on March 26, 2010. So it's been pretty much a decade since she originally went missing. Julie was a very intelligent young woman and she was a very sweet and compassionate and life-loving young woman. She had received a scholarship to attend St. Edwards University and she was very excited about this, but her plans ended up shifting just a little bit shortly after she started attending the school. Julie ended up becoming pregnant with a man named George de la Cruz and their situation wasn't necessarily set up the best. I do not know a lot of information about George's life and lifestyle in that moment, but I do know about information afterwards. And it appeared as if he was very young. He was around the same age as her, but he had a very immature mindset. He didn't want to get a better job to kind of progress their family. I don't know if he went to college, but from the information I gathered, I don't think he did. He just kind of was very immature and she realized very, very quickly that she was probably going to have to be the one to support this family. So because of that, she decided to drop out of school and she became a pharmacy tech at a local Walgreens in Austin, Texas. Her family was not pleased at all about this decision. She did end up marrying George. Her family thought this was a huge mistake. They did not believe George was the right man for her. I think they kind of knew his maturity level was not compatible with being married and having a young child, but they loved Julie, so they decided to support her because as a young mom, having to completely change her life path, it's difficult. But they didn't end up having to support the marriage for long because it lasted for less than a year. George spent majority of his time, and I want to make it very clear that I am not exaggerating. You'll understand more about this later. Majority, almost all of his time playing video games. I think he had a job when they first were married and their daughter Layla was first born, but from what I've seen, he became unemployed fairly quickly. And this 
was not great for Julie. She did not appreciate the fact that he spent no time with her um, through her whole entire pregnancy. And then finally, it became a major problem when their daughter Layla was born. And I think it was kind of a wake up call for Julie because when she was in labor with their daughter, he still chose to play video games. I don't even know if he was present when she was actually born, but either way, he chose to play video games over experiencing the birth of his very first child, and he was not there for Julie, so she decided to get the heck out of there, and she initiated a divorce. George was infuriated and very reluctant. While Julie was ready to absolutely book it away from this man, get out of this marriage, George refused to sign any of the divorce papers. He made it very, very clear to her he was not happy with the marriage ending and he did not want it to end. But regardless, Julie left anyways. And less than a year after the divorce, her life was absolutely flourishing. She was seeing other people. She had just bought a brand new car, something that she had worked so hard for. She ended up being promoted at her job at Walgreens. She was absolutely loving being a mom. And she, I think also was possibly about to move in with someone. But George was living, I think, in his mom's house. And at this point, he was completely unemployed and was still spending day in and day out just playing video games. However, they still had a daughter together and she had no choice but to share custody. It was what they had agreed on. And basically what would happen is one parent would have Layla for a day and then the next day the other parent would have her. And it basically would switch off on a daily basis. Basis. And for the most part, this worked out very, very well for them. But one day in particular, something went very, very wrong. As I said, her life was going great. Every single thing was looking up for her. She was nearing, you know, the end of this divorce. And on March 26, 2010 at 1221 p.m., she started saying very strange things that didn't match up with her as a person or where she was in her life. Julie's family and friends started receiving odd texts and seeing very odd posts on social media. Julie, despite this divorce, was a very bubbly and happy person and she wasn't necessarily one to vent on social media, so red flags were immediately raised for every single person that knew her personally. At 12.21 p.m. on the 26th, which was a Friday, Julie posted to her social media and she said, going away, hate this BS, want to run away. And then another saying, mood hate this BS. Her family and friends were immediately concerned for multiple different reasons, not just because of the fact that Julie was a very bubbly and happy person, but because the posts also weren't her. The posts had little to no punctuation at all. It was a bunch of run on sentences and there were repetitive phrases all throughout the posts. And there was also an absurd amount of emojis that didn't match the tone of the statements. These statements seemed like she was frustrated and sad, upset, depressed, but then the emojis were silly emojis of like laughing faces and crazy faces, silly faces, and it just didn't make a lot of sense. And the posts also seemed to fluctuate in mood every single time there was a new one. It was very, very up and down and the inconsistency didn't make a lot of sense to anyone around her. And then the next day on March 27th, another string of posts began just around 1.57 a.m. She posted, really happy for leaving Austin. I love this place and I miss my baby. And then mood amused. So she kind of went from saying she wanted to run away and didn't like this BS, but you know, without any context. And then Around 12 hours later, she was saying she was out of Austin, she was in another city, but she missed her baby and that she was amused and, you know, I'm not sure what she would have been amused about. And then again, later that same day at 9.40 p.m., she posted again and said, just want to say I'm okay and that people shouldn't worry about me and to stop worrying. Again, kind of repetitive phrases. I want to enjoy my time, mood, adventurous. Her family knew that something was very wrong. As I already said, by the first post, all of the red flags kind of went up for them. But above all things, she would never leave her daughter behind, especially with George. And that is exactly where Layla was at. And that in itself 
told the family something's not right because while she did obviously share custody with George, she did not trust George with Layla for extended periods of time. This was the last person that she would have left her daughter with if she had decided to run off somewhere other than Austin. And she started talking to people in these different posts that she was putting up and was claiming she was running away with some man named James, that she was going to Colorado, just things that didn't make sense. Nobody knew who this James character was. So they decided to go ahead and report her missing. Authorities first wanted to nail down exactly the last time that Julie had been seen. And they were kind of trying to figure out if this was a runaway situation or if foul play was possibly involved. And they ended up finding out pretty quickly that George's house of all places was the last place that Julie was known to have been. And he was the last person to have seen her. According to George, Julie showed up to his house on March 26, 2010, early on in the day to pick up Layla. He had already had her for a day, so it was time for Julie to take Layla for another day. And apparently she did not seem herself. On a routine pickup Friday, George De La Cruz noticed something different about his wife's demeanor. Kind of down. She was like not there. Kind of like spaced out. She ended up asking him to keep their daughter through the weekend. De La Cruz says he would have never thought she'd disappear. When Julie arrived at the house, she was, in his words, spaced out. He said she possibly had been on drugs, that she was very obviously depressed. And despite driving all the way to his house to pick up Layla, she randomly said, oh, wait, you know what? I need you to keep her for a couple more days because I actually need to go somewhere. He apparently asked absolutely no questions as to where she needed to go. This was not typical behavior for her. He just kind of agreed to this and he said right after that she left. And then he claimed that when the time came that she was supposed to pick up Layla, Julie never showed up. At this point, authorities are kind of leaning towards the idea that she absolutely did run away. You know, if you look at the evidence they have so far, everything points to that. She posted on her own social media saying that she wanted to run away, stating that she left Austin. She had said to someone she was leaving with to Colorado with some man named James. The last person to see her said that she was depressed and just kind of up and left. But then things started to become a bit more questionable. On March 28th, her brand new car popped up abandoned in the Walgreens parking lot that she worked at. This parking lot was not far at all from George's home and the car itself was not found by authorities. It was actually found by family because at this point, authorities were conducting no searches. They had just briefly checked over George's house. They had asked everyone questions and that's pretty much it. And the family immediately called authorities. They said something's wrong. She just bought this brand new car. You can't tell me she would leave her daughter and leave her brand new car. Two things she was very, you know, in love with and proud of. But when authorities got there, they didn't seem worried at all. They didn't fingerprint the car. They didn't do anything because they said there was no indication whatsoever at all that there was foul play. There was no blood in the car. There was no sign of a struggle. The doors were locked. Everything was secure. The keys had not been left in the car. So they just kind of handed the car over to the family and did absolutely no forensic examination. Authorities were very reluctant to pretty much take any other possibility than running away seriously at this point. On top of not finding the placement of her brand new car weird or the fact that she left this car behind, uh, they kind of brushed over a few things at George's house as well. When investigators first went to search the house to see if maybe Julie was hiding somewhere in there or if they were hiding her somewhere, one of the officers ended up noticing a trench dug out in the backyard in pretty much one of their sheds. And this is very odd and should have been incredibly alarming for authorities, but they went to George and George just told them, you know, the previous owners, they dug that for plumbing purposes. We had nothing to do with it. There also were scratches on George's nose and authorities knew that and stated that later on, but it was never documented. They were really skimming over these very small bits of information and details that would have easily led them to the truth about what really happened to Julie. 
So of course they're not going to suspect foul play because all of the small indications that there could have been foul play, they were choosing to ignore. And again, because they didn't suspect foul play, they weren't able to get any warrants to search pretty much anything. They couldn't get a warrant for Julie's phone to track it because technically, again, if she wants to run away, she had the legal right to, and her digital device is her privacy. So after this point, the investigation completely stalled. Her family knew and swore up and down something was so very wrong, she would never, ever, ever leave her child behind. She would never abandon her car. She was getting out of this very rocky divorce. They knew something was wrong, but authorities refused to look at it any other way than a runaway situation. But after a few months and no contact at all from Julie, authorities finally started to wonder if they had it all wrong. Because the very first 48 hours after Julie was last seen, she was texting people, she was posting to social media, she was saying this, saying that, and then all of a sudden she vanished they finally, I think, were clicking things together. Authorities decided to go ahead and finally fight for a warrant to search Julie's cell phone and look into her pings. And after compiling a history of data, they were able to look at a pattern. So as you know, Julie swapped off Layla every other day. And every single time Julie went to drop off or pick up Layla, she would only spend a few minutes at George's house. And the pings proved this pattern over a very extended period of time. But the day that she was last seen, and the only time this ever happened, Julie's phone stayed within the vicinity of George's house for three hours, which was odd in itself compared to the pattern, but also didn't match up at all to what George had originally told authorities. There were 27 different cell connections that day. So basically connections when it connects to Wi-Fi, texts are sent out when there's some sort of communication between a cell phone and a tower, those are connections. And just after 10.50 a.m. that day, 22 of those 27 cell connections all occurred within George's home. Then by 8 p.m. that night, her cell phone pinged again by a local Best Buy, and then the following day, the phone pinged off a tower that Julie's phone had never pinged off before, and authorities couldn't find any reason at all as to why Julie would have been in that particular location. And then in May, something happened that caused authorities to finally execute a warrant on George's house. His own mother called in to report something suspicious that authorities could have caught the very first time. George's mom said that she walked outside and was looking around and she noticed this trench that had been dug in one of their sheds and she knew that it was not there. So George's story that the previous owners had dug this for plumbing purposes was a gigantic lie. And on top of that, there was a giant burn mark in a portion of the yard and it was very obvious someone had burned clothes there because there was still a part of an unburnt purple shoelace where this giant patch was. She knew something was wrong. So she called 911 and authorities immediately got a warrant and came to search the house. Joe and detectives arrived here this morning. Now this is the home of Julian Gonzalez's estranged husband. You can take a look behind me. You can see that crime scene van still there parked in front of the home. APD says that they were conducting a search warrant but are not giving us any details since they say this is still an open investigation. Now homicide detectives, as we mentioned in crime scene investigators, arrived here before 9 this morning. This is a home, as we said, of Gonzalez's estranged husband and the person who last saw the missing mom back in March. You can see him there in the black t-shirt standing with family members. Authorities towed two vehicles away this morning that were registered to the husband's family members. They also took several items from inside the house. Search dogs were also brought in to trace any evidence. Now, APD says that this is still being investigated investigated as a missing persons case, but Julianne's family has told Fox 7 in the past that they fear something may have happened to Julianne. When authorities got there, George's mom was so upset, they actually ended up having to call an ambulance for her because her heart rate got so high. That's how scared she was of what she had found. That is how scared she was of realizing her son may possibly be connected to something. And she was taken away and authorities continued to search the house. Now, at first, they did not say what exactly they took from the home. They did tell the media that there were a few items that they were looking for that they found, but there were also a few that they were specifically looking for that were nowhere to be found. And this is kind of when George stopped being cooperative. It became very clear that George was hiding something, at least some 
some information that could progress the case, but authorities had absolutely no physical proof that he did anything or that Julie was no longer alive, so it made it near impossible to get any more information. Authorities had been trying to convince a judge to get a warrant for all of his electronic devices, and they kept hitting wall after wall. It already took an arm and a leg to get all of Julie's information because they had no physical evidence of foul play. So looking into a potential person of interest information was 10 times harder. But finally, after pushing enough, they got the warrant that they needed and this led them to the jackpot they had been looking for. They were looking into all of Julie's digital data. So all of her social media, her cell phone pings, the different networks that she had been on. And they ended up finding some interesting parallels to the digital data that they were receiving finally from George. On March 31st at George's friend's house, the same network that George had used to log into his social media was used again to log into Julie's, only seven minutes apart. And this particular location was also the bizarre location that Julie's phone pinged, the same tower she had never ever pinged to before. They also decided to look into George's Xbox activity and find out what his typical gaming patterns were. And they realized that he only stayed off of his Xbox for very, very short periods of time, as I told you guys in the beginning of this video. But on the particular day and time that Julie went missing, he didn't log into his Xbox account for five hours, something completely uncharacteristic of his typical login behaviors. Like this almost had never happened before unless he was sleeping. And finally, they checked security footage. Now this is something they should have done right off the bat. I see no reason as to why they could not have done this. I am unaware if they needed a warrant to do this, but I feel like if someone is missing and there is a potential that they could have run away or even something happened to them, Security footage would be the first thing that you would check and her bank card had been used multiple times. It had been used at a McDonald's, at a Walmart, at a HEB. I think it had been used at a Best Buy. And if they had checked it right after she disappeared, they would have immediately found a problem because it was not Julie that was using these cards. It was George. Just a few hours after Julie was last seen supposedly by George, George was seen in Walmart with Layla purchasing a video game and some baby supplies with Julie's card. Ugh, it makes me so frustrated that these small things were completely, completely overlooked until months later. They also checked to see what George was doing at the time that Julie's phone pinged at Best Buy. And sure enough, George was there at the exact same time, exact same location. And they didn't only have security footage to prove it, but they also had receipts. And again, Julie's card had been used. But unfortunately, all of this information was circumstantial. They had not a single shred of physical evidence still, just a whole bunch of circumstantial evidence, and we all know how that usually holds up in court. But they decided that based on this evidence, they were still going to go forward with attempting to charge him for Julie's murder because they knew at this point she wasn't showing up. All of this odd information, one plus one equals two. She's likely no longer alive anymore. So on September 13th, 2013, authorities arrested and charged George with Julie's murder. And this was incredibly risky. As I stated before, when it comes to solved no body cases, it's already difficult only relying on physical evidence and physical evidence is pretty damning. But when you don't have a body and you also have no physical evidence, it's basically an impossible task to accomplish. And then on top of that, majority of their circumstantial evidence was digital data that would be almost impossible for jurors to understand in its original state. So it took two whole years and then some for the prosecution to basically find a way to show jurors this digital data in a way that they would understand it. They used JPEGs and PDF and kind of altered things to hope that the jury got what they were saying. Finally, in 2015, the trial started. And while they were relying heavily on digital forensics, 
the other information finally started being released. His mom ended up testifying against him, talking about this trench and also talking about a particular moment when she realized he probably knew more than he was letting on. There was one part of the conversation that appeared to have um, startled him a little bit. Carrie Osmond said while neighbors talked about what may have happened, one neighbor mentioned seeing two men that day escorting Julianne Gonzalez towards the same backyard where that evidence was collected. How did De La Cruz react to hearing that? He appeared to uh, uh, kind of collapsed a little bit on the frame of the door and his face turned white. On top of that, there was another witness that came forward that had been in jail with George while he was awaiting his trial for the whole two years. And this person says George confided in him. He said that George was really reluctant at first to talk about what exactly he was going to trial for. He eventually told this informant that he got into a physical altercation with Julie, that they were arguing because she was starting to see another man and he still didn't want the divorce and he was pissed about it. And then he eventually told this informant as well that Julie ended up hitting her head and she was bleeding and unconscious. But he never went on to state any more details, never went on to admit that he was guilty or anything. Now, a lot of people, again, immediately believed this informant was just coming forward to get some time knocked off of their sentence, but this informant immediately shut the defense down. Whether you believe it or not, I didn't care about the deal. There's a doubt. There's a little girl involved. Authorities also finally released what exactly they found in George's home. And this to me is probably the bits of circumstantial evidence that carried this case all the way through. New evidence about what was found at George De La Cruz's backyard was shown for the jury today at his murder trial. His estranged wife, Julianne Gonzalez, disappeared five years ago and was never found. KXAN's Chris Sadegui is live from the courthouse with more on that new evidence. Chris? So far, that backyard trench has received the most attention. It got more attention today, but we also saw some other items found in that backyard for the first time. When George De La Cruz's mother found this trench in their backyard, she knew something wasn't right. She was uh, obviously emotionally um, distraught. It was, it was obvious to us that something had happened just prior to her calling the police department. That when police arrived, they looked at the trench, but they also noticed a knife, ammunition, and a black patch in the backyard where it appeared clothing had been burned. The situation, a shock to the person who lived there. We even had to call the ambulance to the house because of her accelerated heart rate and her nerves. Five years later, that trench and that evidence is being used against her son, George. This trench that had been dug, there was a knife that was found near it as well as bullets. Now, I am thrilled this stuff was there. However, all I can think about is when authorities first saw this trench and knowing that if they just took two extra seconds to look deeper into what was going on there, that could have drastically changed how this case went. They also found inside of the home Julie's debit card and Julie's car keys. Now, the only way he would have had Julie's car keys is if he was the one that dropped her car off, which means how on earth did she actually leave his house? This bit of information, as I said before, I'm sure is what actually helped carry this case through. After six days of testimony and then seven hours of deliberation, so a fairly short trial, George ended up being found guilty of Julie's murder and was sentenced to life in prison. The conclusion of this five years of both families going back and forth and back and forth didn't end well either because Julie's family still had absolutely no idea where the body was and George's family was pissed despite the fact that his mom testified against him and said there was definitely something odd going on. Both families were incredibly upset in the courtroom. Julie's family came on the stand and totally dragged George to hell and back. And then as soon as everyone started to leave the room, there was a whole bunch of yelling. It was a really, really messy scene. And it was heartbreaking, honestly, to watch because her family got this bit of closure because this man was charged with their you know loved one's murder but then they still didn't know where she was and unfortunately the prosecution was very straightforward with the family and said that most of the time when there is a guilty verdict the guilty party stops giving information and the prosecution said that at this point because he basically lied and eluded authorities for so long and 
impersonated Julie to make everyone think it was a different way that despite any information he ever eventually wanted to give up, they would never ever give him any sort of deal in order to do so. So that lessens the chances even more that he will ever come forward and admit to what exactly he did and where he put Julie. Can you just talk to us about your reaction? Obviously it was very emotional in the courtroom. Just to know that he's, He's not going to have any freedom. It's a comfort. It's not a closure. But it's a comfort knowing that he, what he did to Julie, he did to himself too. A lot of high emotions from both families out here in the hallway and in the courtroom. Obviously, this is something both families are, are impacted by. Very emotional, but you know, the, the good thing about our family is we take the high road. We always take the high road. There's no reason to attack anybody. But at the same time, if we're being attacked, then you better expect for us to respond to that. Because you know what? We can only we can only uh, stay quiet for so long. And we were under attack in that courtroom by his family. So, what do you guys? Um do from here I understand for you you've said again and again this is not over for you guys I love this quote just keep living this whole case is just heartbreaking and frustrating to me because she was trying to do the best that she could for herself and for her daughter and he felt so entitled to pretty much whatever he wanted, that he took her life so that nobody else could have her. Her family has tried to use this as an example to other young men and women in similar types of relationships. It's a very scary situation and it's terrifying to me that there were all these little red flags all over the place and authorities just blatantly disregarded them and then they even went on further to claim they were duped and they had been so successfully tricked. There were clues everywhere. If they had actually opened their eyes and didn't focus on one idea, they would have easily seen there was something very, very wrong going on here. And I know hindsight is 2020, but to me, it's so obvious. I feel like being in the moment, before I even knew the verdict, before I knew anything, just originally looking into this case, all these red flags popped up for me. There's no way the authorities didn't kind of question any of this information. The defense had pretty much one thing they were banking on and even their one argument didn't even make any sense whatsoever. If that doesn't tell you how obvious it was that George was involved in this, their argument was that he was seen on footage later that day at Walmart shopping. So he would never have had a large enough time frame to do something to Julie, clean up his house, and then dispose of a body in time to go shopping and then have family over later that night. But you guys, think about that. The defense's argument <laughs> was there's no way he could have killed her because he was too busy a couple hours later using her debit card at Walmart. Like, You've got to be kidding me, you guys. This is so incredibly frustrating. If I were her family, I would be so livid. Aside from that, the conversation that I really want to have in the comments down below and something that I've never really looked into until this case is digital forensics. You know, it's like I was saying before, how many times have we wondered if someone willingly ran away or if something happened and we've always wanted there to be some sign left behind so we could know the difference. In this case, there was. There were plenty of text messages. There were plenty of posts to social media, but I feel like people forget that just because someone sends a text, just because a text is sent from someone's phone or someone's profile, there's a post made to it, it's all digital. Anyone who has access to it can post that. That does not mean in any way, shape, or form that said person is 100% the one who said it. And this is an example of that, you know? Authorities saw these posts and they decided to not look into any other possible avenue to back this up. They used this one bit of information to back up their idea that she ran away. If they had just taken one other step, like looking into security footage, checking her phone pings, anything, they would have immediately, within probably a week, 
of her disappearance realized this was not the case. And probably the most frustrating comment that I get when I cover cases like this, but ones that are left more open-ended is, oh, this seems super cut, cut and dry to me like this person ran away. Please don't say that. There is no telling. Imagine if everyone stuck with this theory. This man would be out, still taking care of their daughter, knowing damn well that he murdered his ex-wife and his daughter's mother. And then I find it so incredibly ironic that the one thing that totally slowed this case down, that put the idea into the head of authorities that she absolutely ran away, that they used as proof of this, you know, this digital information, this digital data, ended up also being the only thing that solved this case. Like that, I don't know what to call that. Is it a paradox, a conundrum? I don't know. I, know, I think paradox is like technically like a phrase as well as conundrum. Hopefully you guys will let me know what the word is. I cannot think of it in my brain right now, but that is so wild to me. And it makes me want to start a conversation on what you guys think about social media and our rights to privacy and everything along those lines because it took authorities so much effort to get warrants to search Julie's digital data as well as George's digital data. And from information that I am read, those types of warrants are the hardest to get out of all warrants. And you have to be so incredibly specific. There has to be usually some sort of physical evidence involved in the case. There has to be probable cause. The authorities have to be very specific about what exact data they're looking for and from what exact device. It is one of the most restricted information that authorities are kept from because it is protected legally. It's our privacy. But the problem that we're running into, the larger media gets and the larger that this digital world grows is that all of these different avenues of digital data, whether it be, you know, social media, our cell phones, text messages, phone pings, networks, everything like that, it holds majority of our lives. Everything for the most part that happens to us is held within our digital data. And that could be great for authorities because it could give them a huge chance to solve multiple cases that without digital data, they probably couldn't. It's a double-edged sword because it's also all of our personal information and we are legally protected. And it's basically turning into this giant gray area and there is this huge movement right now on digital forensics, but it is so expensive to train any of these detectives to be able to work with it. I think five different detectives in Texas were sent to training to just learn basics and it cost $40,000 to send them. And everything they learn pretty much changes every couple of months because every time Apple or Android or anyone updates their technology or comes out with a new device, all the information has to be re relearned. It's all new. So it's this constant revolving door. So I really want you guys to let me know down below what do you think about digital forensics? You know, do you think that it should be easier for authorities to get into our cell phones, to get into our computers, to, you know, track and ping our phones? Do you think it should be easier to access that because there's such a massive potential that answers to crimes are in that information? Or do you think that it's fine just where it is and it should be harder for authorities to get into it? It's such an interesting topic that I'd never really thought of before or considered until I realized how crucial it was to this case in particular. If it had been any harder to get into digital data, this man would be free like completely scot-free. So while I enjoy my privacy and I don't want it to be easy personally for authorities to access all of my private information because I know I keep a lot of it in digital data, at the same time, I never want a man like this to get away because it requires literally astronomical amounts of information from authorities in order to even have access to that data. I just think this is honestly probably going to be one of the next big things in the crime community. I know there is this huge thing going on about, you know, DNA and touch DNA and different ways to retrieve DNA. And if DNA is even something that should really make or break a case and how easy it can be to, you know, have DNA that means absolutely nothing. We rely too much on it. But then there's also this huge movement where DNA is solving 
thousands and thousands of cases, but again, another double-edged sword. DNA shouldn't equal guilt, so why do we treat it like it does? These people could be innocent. It's just a mess. I feel like with the rate that digital data is progressing at the moment and the amount of information and the amount of people that use digital data this is going to be the next big issue that we have. So I'm so interested to see what you guys have to say about it. I know that Julie's family is so incredibly thankful that this digital data was accessible to them and that authorities were finally able to get to it because they probably would still be on an absolute roller coaster if this information was not accessible. But on that note, you guys, I'm gonna go ahead and go. Thank you so much for taking the time out of your day to listen to Julie's story. I know this was kind of a little bit of a different video for me. I'm so excited to see what you guys have to say about digital data down below. I have like fallen down this rabbit hole now that I absolutely cannot get out of. So I cannot wait to hear your opinions on it. But as always, do not forget to hit that subscribe button if you haven't already so you can join the Howland fam and we can bring them home together. And I I will see you guys in my next video. Bye.